Hello, everybody. It's good to see you, all of you. Welcome. Please turn with me to the book of Psalms, and we'll look at Psalm 37. If you've come because you want a good dose of the Lord and counsel from Him, direction, guidance, a view of Him that will ground you and settle your spirit uh, and inspire you, Psalm 37 is one of the best places in the Bible. It's got a lot of verses in it, 40, so we'll begin reading right away, and we'll read to the end of the psalm. Psalm 37, verse 1, fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in Him, and He will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it only tends to evil. For the evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. In just a little while the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land, or the earth, and delight themselves in abundant peace. The wicked plots against the righteous and gnashes his teeth at him. But the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he sees that his day is coming. The wicked draw the sword and bend their bows to bring down the poor and needy to slay those whose way is upright. Their sword shall enter their own heart, and their bow shall be broken. Better is the little that the righteous has than the abundance of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. The Lord knows the days of the blameless, and their heritage will remain forever. They are not put to shame in evil times. In the days of famine they have abundance. But the wicked will perish. The enemies of the Lord are like the glory of the pastors. They vanish like smoke, they vanish away. The wicked borrows but does not pay back. But the righteous is generous and gives. For those blessed by the Lord shall inherit the land, but those cursed by him shall be cut off. The steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be cast headlong, for the Lord upholds his hand. I have been young and now I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. He's ever lending generously, and his children become a blessing. Turn away from evil and do good, so shall you dwell forever. For the Lord loves justice. He will not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever, but the children of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell upon it forever. The mouth of the righteous utters wisdom and his tongue speaks justice. The law of his God is in his heart. His steps do not slip. The wicked watches for the righteous and seeks to put him to death. The Lord will not abandon him to his power or let him be condemned when he is brought to trial. Wait for the Lord and keep his way and he will exalt you to inherit the land. You will look on when the wicked are cut off I have seen a wicked, ruthless man spreading himself like a green laurel tree, but he passed away, and behold, he was no more. Though I sought him, he could not be found. Mark the blameless, and behold the upright, for there is a future for the man of peace, but transgressors shall be altogether destroyed. The future of the wicked shall be cut off. The salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their stronghold in the time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. 
He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in Him. Our current moment in time is an interesting one, is it not? A two-week lockdown that has been turned into a many-month lockdown, a threatened economy, high unemployment, rioters destroying things all over the country from monuments to statues to businesses to homes, people of a particular ethnic stock being told they're inherently bad. That's actually happening in some cases. of a dramatically reduced police force in places, certain places in the country. A criminal element that is emboldened now, and that is palpable in some places. Marxists operating openly. These are the things that we're facing in our country right now, apparently. That's significant. If all this is true, then this is admittedly a very disturbing, very disturbing time. It is in times like these that Christian people are tested. It is in times like these that you will be tested. Even if we're not completely evaluating the times correctly, and even if perhaps we're misunderstanding certain things that are going on, when these are the things that we're being told is happening in our country and we see evidences of it even perhaps in our own towns, then you have to respond to that information. And so, even if there's some misperception going on, which undoubtedly there is in some cases, you still are being tested. Because Hot water situations bring out what's in the tea bag. And times like these are the hot water, and guess who's the tea bag? You and me. What's coming out of us? Looking through the scriptures for help for these times, which is what we all ought to be doing constantly, consistently. Have you noticed how full the scriptures are of help for times like this? It's like you go to every passage, and it's like, oh, more help. It's like it was written for people in hardship. Exactly. Looking through the scriptures, I haven't been able to find a better, better bit of help than Psalm 37. That psalm really just seems to just hit the nail on the head in so many different ways. There's hardly more fitting counsel to people who are being tempted to fret about evildoers. In fact, that's the message, the name of the message, the title of the message today is Don't Fret About Evildoers taking that title directly from the very first line of the psalm. When evildoers arise and gain the upper hand, people are tempted in all sorts of ways. The psalm counsels us about such a setting, what to do. I mean, the first 14 or so verses is just filled with directive after directive after directive. God basically speaking to us and telling us how we should respond in situations like this. In fact, Psalm 37 is a psalm of instruction. It's a didactic psalm. There's no per, uh, praise per se in it. There's no prayer in it. It's all do this, do this, do this, and this is why, and this is why. It's almost like a sermon, in fact. And it no doubt came from David's own personal experience. As Henry said, that is preached best, which is first preached to oneself. Boy, that's the truth. That is preached best, that is first preached. To oneself. And so what I want to do today is I want to look through the psalm, and I want to look at three things. Let me give you those three things so you can kind of get a uh, foretaste of what we're going to be doing, and as we go through the three steps of the message, you'll, you'll uh, be aware of it because I have, I have already told you about it in advance. So I want to do three things. Number one, I want to look at the distress that David is going through or that he's counseling people about. So we'll look at, this, at the distress that has led David to speak as he does here. 
And then what we'll do, secondly, is we'll consider the temptations such times of distress bring about. Times like this bring about particular temptations. You'll be, I think you may have already sensed it when we read through the psalm earlier, that it really does almost uncannily mirror some things that are going on right now in our society. And I want to make that crystallized, crystal clear for us. So number one, we're going to look at the distress that leads David to talk as he does here. And then number two, we'll consider the temptations that such times of distress bring about. And then number three, we'll reflect on the reasons for quiet trust. There's a, a verse in Isaiah that says, in quietness and faith will be your strength. This must never be, must never be chucked you must never get rid of quietness and trust and faith. And so, number one, the current distress. The current distress. So, what do you do when you read the Psalms? This is actually, I found, I preached through the first 41 Psalms in a couple years' time, and I kept noticing over and over again that this method, this particular method, really helps you to crystallize Psalms for yourself. When I say crystallize, what I mean is really be able to see clearly, very clearly, what the psalm is about, and then you can parallel it to certain circumstances in life. So it's a very helpful tool. I'm going to share it with you right now. It's helpful when studying many psalms to crystallize for yourself what the setting in life was that led David to speak as he does. And you do that by kind of being a little bit like Sherlock Holmes, okay? You read through the psalm, and um, you just basically piece together the situation from hints that he gives. This psalm is a really great example of it. It's really easy to do with this psalm. Some psalms, you have to read and read and read, and then you're like, you hone in on one statement, and you're like, oh, ho, I see it. There's the clue. This one is, they're all over the place. Okay. It's very easy to piece together the background of the psalm, or at least get an idea of what he was, he was going through, what his, his, his concern really is. So you piece together the situation from clues he drops along the way as he, as he speaks. So what is this current distress then? Let's look at it. I'll give you some of the pieces of evidence. Let's be Sherlock here, okay? Obviously, the first thing he's concerned about are evildoers, right? Verse 1, the psalm also calls them wrongdoers in verse 1, the wicked in verse 12, the ruthless in verse 35, and transgressors in verse 38. So the psalm calls them various, various things. Evildoers, wrongdoers, the wicked, ruthless, and transgressors. So obviously it's concerned about that. And he's also concerned about not just evildoers, but the ones who are prospering doing their evil. You see that in verse 7, the one who prospers in his way, who carries out evil devices. See, he's not just... This, he, he's not concerned just about an evildoer in a corner somewhere thrashing around wishing he could do some evil. Now, here's a guy who actually is a threat. So, evildoers who are prospering doing their evil and plotting hatefully against righteous people. You see that in verse 12. Notice it says, the wicked plots against the righteous and gnashes his teeth at him. Oh, goodness. That is in extreme language. I hope when you read the Bible and you read language like that, that you can feel it. You should feel it. When the Bible says somebody is gnashing their teeth at somebody, that is just nasty imagery. Can you imagine somebody doing that and what their face would look like? I'll never forget seeing footage once, um, night, some night footage of wolves who were hunting. Have you ever seen a snarling wolf, the face of a, of a wolf that's really snarling? It's one of the most terrifying things you can ever see. Their faces are designed to where they can screw them up a certain way, to where they just simply look demonic. Now imagine a human being whose face is like that, gnashing their teeth at people. See, the way I is almost too tame, plotting hatefully against the righteous. I just threw that word hatefully in there because that really seems to fit. We're talking about people who have worked themselves up into a frenzy of hate. 
So we're talking about evildoers who are prospering, doing their evil, and plotting hatefully against the righteous. And they're preparing to do violence, verse 14. It says, the wicked draw the sword and bend the bow against the righteous. Or, excuse me, to bring down the poor and the needy. To slay those whose way is upright. They're out for blood. And then notice verse 35, he describes them as actually making headway with their plan. So not only are they rubbing their hands together, plotting evil hatefully, and really, really, really angry and, and, in a, and kind of in a, in a rage, but they're actually spreading themselves like a green tree. That means they're making progress. And that's the most scary thing. When you see people who are not just plotting, but they're taking steps and succeeding. See, you're beginning to pick up the setting, aren't you? And once you crystallize the setting, suddenly the psalm even comes more to life. This is a, this is a tool that you ought to use every time you study a psalm, or a lot of the times you use the psalms. You go through the psalm and you think, first thing, all right, I have to crystallize what the actual setting is for myself before I can really appreciate the teaching in the psalm. And the setting is that people are, are after you and they have the means to hurt you. They plot, they're sharpening their knives, so to speak, and are actually succeeding in taking steps to advance their evil plans. And of course, what I'm describing is really a remarkably accurate picture of what people are afraid of right now in our culture. in our current political situation. And the remarkable thing and kind of comforting thing is that we're reading about it in 3,000-year-old literature right now. It's Psalm 37. There's nothing new under the sun. In fact, Matthew Henry not, no, made this exact observation in his commentary. On, listen, to, listen to this great quote from Henry. He says, When we see a world full of evildoers who prosper and have what they want and do what they will, and they have the power in their hands to harm others... Don't be surprised, as if it were some new strange thing. Oh, great comment. Is that not somewhat comforting? You may feel like it's a strange thing because in your lifetime, it's never in your particular country or locale ever gotten to this, this kind of luridly fervent pitch of hate. But if you look at the history of mankind, this is the norm. There's nothing new under the sun. It was the norm in David's life. It was the norm during the Puritan era. I pray that it won't become the norm in our country. There is comfort in knowing that God has been encouraging his people about this for thousands of years. So, that's what we've done there is we've crystallized the setting by simply dipping into the psalm and noting details that help us see a bigger picture, a more full picture, okay? So step one of our message today was, what is this current distress? And I've looked at this probably enough. Let's move on now to the second stage. And that is, what are the temptations that such a situation bring about? You probably have already sensed some of those temptations in your own life. You may be struggling with them every day of your life right now. Especially if you watch certain news shows and you walk away going, oh, we're doomed. That can't be all right. <laughs> okay. This can't be an accurate picture. Um, what you've got to do is you've got to recognize what those particular temptations are that this kind of panicky setting is bringing to you. What's it doing to you? It's the hot water. You're the tea bag. What's coming out? That's a really important question to ask in times like this. Well, you go back to the psalm and you ask the same question. What is he counseling people about? See, you can piece together the temptations that people are facing by looking at what he tells people to do in this setting. And so, let's take a look at the temptations. There's quite a few of them here, and you can see them right off the bat. Number one, the first temptation is to fret. <laughs> okay. What does that mean? It says, fret not yourselves because of evildoers, verse 1. What does it mean to fret? Well, to worry and protest and express your displeasure in heated ways. In fact, that word fret is often translated in the Bible as kindled wrath. It has the idea of heat. 
that grows. We talk about people getting hot under the collar, okay? Those, these are all just metaphors that just try to describe what happens emotionally in people when they feel threatened. In other words, a fire is kindled and flares up and gets hot. Uh, a great word is the term incensed. He was incensed at what the city council was proposing. Okay, we get that word immediately, okay? We get it. And all we have to do is put it into a context like that, and immediately it makes sense. So we can even feel the emotional experience of what it's like to go through something like that. See, David is saying here, when he says, don't fret yourself because of evildoers, he's saying, don't become antagonized. Don't be provoked. Don't let your emotional temperature start to rise. As I used to tell some Greek students um, that, that I had um, who were teenagers, and I could tell when they would have to take tests, their emotional temperature started to rise, I would say, guys, you need to stay cool as a cucumber. That's when you think best. And they would always laugh at the cool as a cucumber, and it would help them to relax, and then they would be able to take the test better. Stay cool as a cucumber. You've got to keep the emotional temperature from rising. Don't fret yourself. In fact, we're told three times in the passage, don't fret yourself. Other people's evil can provoke us so that we end up just like them. Have you thought, have you considered that? Other people's evil can provoke us and we end up looking uncomfortably like the people who provoked us. This happens, I think, one of the best stories in the Bible to illustrate what he's talking about here, about don't fret yourself, don't get all provoked and in a, you know, some kind of state, is probably found in 1 Samuel 25, and I'll ask you to go over there and we'll look at this story. This is the story of David and Nabal. Do you remember Nabal? You can turn over there and glance through it. I, I just realized for the sake of time, I should probably just summarize the story for you, so let me just summarize it. It's in 1 Samuel 25, verses 4 through, 4 through 38. It's kind of a long passage, but I'll just summarize the story for you. So there was a beautiful young lady who somehow ended up being married to an idiot named Nabal. The Bible calls him a fool. So using the term idiot is just maybe a little bit harsher way to describe him. But when you read about read what the guy, in fact, his, word, his name, Nabal, is the word for fool. And uh, he couldn't speak to somebody peaceably. Anytime he would even speak, he was an absolute, total, cruel person. Every time. He couldn't speak peaceably to anybody. He alienated people constantly. And this, of course, is foolish. <laughs> and, of course, you wonder, how did Abigail, Abigail ever end up with a guy like this? Who knows? We're not told. Well, David is not king at this point in his life, but he is like a, almost like an overlord of a small, small tract of land. He's got hundreds of warriors under him. He almost reminds me a little bit of the stories about Robin Hood, Robin, Robin of Sherwood. Um, I've, there are many times where I've thought that. He's kind of got his band of merry men, and they're off in the wilderness together. And one of the things he does is he recognizes that there are these people who are wealthy landowners that he's protecting with his band of men. And so he naturally wants some help from these people that he's helping. This isn't a protection racket. It's just simply, please help me out. Feed, our, feed my men. We're, we're, you know, doing a real service to you. So he sends... Uh, some people, and asked Nabal, who is under his protection, to give him some food so they can live. And Nabal, true to his name, treats them as the fool that he is. When the men come back and tell David, guess what David's response is? Okay, here it is. David, this is what Nabal said. And David's response is, everybody... Strap on your swords. Did you feel the emotional temperature go up? I wonder if David's pulse started to pound. David gets on, they all get on their horses and they start riding. He says, I'm going to slay every male there. <laughs> Whoa. 
David has, David has kind of leapt off the deep end into the typical barbarian warlord of, of ancient history. And you can study this, and it doesn't matter what culture you study it in. You can study it in the Vikings. You can study it in the Zulus. These kinds of barbarian overlords would absolutely be as brutal as you can possibly imagine when they stormed in to whatever area they wanted to take with their men. And it's a lot worse than just lopping off heads. And D David was in full-on barbarian overlord mode. And he's riding in. And this woman, Abigail, who is so, such a remarkable person, must have known that this is how David would have responded, probably because anybody would have responded that way. They would have been utterly irate and thought, I, I, the, the earth should stop having to bear the burden of this guy. And so she brings all the stuff that those, guys, those men needed. She brings it in a big cart or on donkeys or whatever. I can't remember now how she did it. But she brings a bunch and she intercepts the whole tro troop of men. And she basically looks at David and says, God forbid that you should avenge yourself. Let God avenge you. In other words, she reminds, she reminds David that he's a, a Bible believer. She reminds David that, that he trusts in God. And it snaps him out of his, his murderous attitude. And he thanks her right there and says, God bless you for keeping me from that terrible sin. See, that's the point of the story. Nabal was the provoker. And David almost fell in to being as bad as or worse. Or worse than Nabal. See... Other people's evil can provoke you so that you end up just like them. Remember the story from 1 Samuel 25 and avoid it. Let Abigail speak to you and say, no, trust God. Plumer on uh, the Psalms says, quote, indulging in even a little irritability torments yourself and displeases God. Have you ever noticed that? When you express even a little irritability, you're, it's like you're creating torment in the world. You're bringing it, you're, you're, it's like, I mean, what kind of things can you create anyway? How much power and control do you have in your life? Not a whole lot, really. Don't you ever feel that way? Like, oh, there's hardly anything that I can do. One thing you can do is create an emotional temperature in a room. And expressing a lot of irritability sure creates it. The Bible talks about people who are peacemakers. When they walk into a room, peace is made. So the first temptation, when you see this kind of setting, the kind of setting that, per, that perhaps is happening in our own country, perhaps, the first temptation is to fret. It's to get kindled, hot under the collar, and start creating torment and what we need to hear is, trust God, be at peace. Second, second temptation is to distrust God. Look what he says in verse 3. He says, trust in the Lord and do good. You see that? Trust in the Lord. One of the big temptations is to not trust God. When evil people seem to prevail and the righteous are enraged, the righteous must recognize they've stumbled into sin when they recognize that terrible emotional state. Do you, you realize that God wants you to be in a state, an, an emotional state that registers faith in God? And this, enra this state of being fretting and enraged and angry and afraid and full of fear and tumult, that's not the peace he wants. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on God because he trusts in God. Isaiah 26, verse 3. And so in times like this, it's incum incumbent upon us to reaffirm our faith in God. Reaffirm it. You, you know what it means to exercise faith in God. You did that when you became a Christian. When you became a Christian, you heard the gospel. You reached out the message about faith in Christ, and you, you grabbed a hold of it because you needed it. You do that right now. You reaffirm that. 
You express your faith in God all over again, and you rest in His hand. And you can say to Him, I don't know why you're allowing these things to happen, but it seems like you've been allowing them to happen for a very long time, and you are leading the world to the, in, to the conclusion that you want to lead it to. And I, you know, this is way too big for me. I can't make judgment calls about you and how you providentially guide the world. You know all things. I don't. I am small. I'm going to rest in your hand because I know that it's nail-scarred, and it holds me. You trust God. Because in times like these, you are tempted to distrust Him. How many times has your heart sunk? How many times have you went, ah, oh, this situation? And suddenly, you're starting to create torment. Reaffirm your faith in the gospel. Reaffirm, re grab a hold of his feet all over again like those women who fell at his feet after he was resurrected from the dead. Grab a hold of them all, flee to Christ all over again. You have to do that constantly. And I'm at my worst when I don't do it. And there are plenty of times when I fail. I have to remind myself, oh, I need to flee to Christ again for power. Another thing we're tempted to do is to stop doing good, verse 3. He says, trust in the Lord and do good. You see, what he's telling him to do is he's telling them to go against these temptations. What are the temptations? To fret, to not trust God, to stop doing good. People literally look at all the evildoers and they go, ah, oh, look how horrible those evildoers are. And then they stop doing good because of them. Even as they criticize them, they join their ranks. This is exactly what David was tempted to do, right? He was provoked by Nabal, and so he went on into overlord mode. Get your swords. Whoa, what are you, a Viking? What happened to you, the sweet singer of Israel? Who do you think you are? You used to praise God, and now you're wanting to slaughter? Because you're angry about how this reflects on you? What it's going to do to you? And when she said those kinds of things to him, he thanked her because he really was good at heart. Fourth one, fourth temptation, to stop delighting in God. Notice that in verse 4, delight yourself in the Lord. See, we're tempted to stop doing that. Rage at threats. Is there anything that is more fragile than love and delight in God? It's like a flower that gets so easily stomped into the mud by other emotions. We're tempted to stop delighting in God. We're tempted to stomp that beautiful, precious, and fragile flower into the mud when we get all fretting. Rage at threats and lack of trust shows that we don't really think much of God. Another thing that the passage says, verse 7, we're tempted to agitate and be impatient. Notice what he says there. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Be still in quietness and faith. That shall be your strength. If we don't trust God, who do we trust? Another thing that we're tempted to do is found uh, a little bit later in verse 8. It says, refrain from anger and forsake wrath. We are tempted to get angry. You know what the Bible says about an angry man? He stirs up strife, and here it is, quote, abounds in transgressions. Proverbs 29, 22. Abounds in transgressions. Where do all these temptations come from? Let me just list them for you again. Temptations to fret, to distrust God, to stop doing good, to stop delighting in God. Oh, the importance of joy. To agitate and be impatient, to resort to anger. Where do, where do all these temptations come from? You tell me. What is the root? Think about your own, ex, own emotional roller coaster that you perhaps have gone through as you've looked at um, our culture in the last several weeks. Where, does all, where do all the temptations stem? I think there's a master response, and there are a bunch of hydra heads that just spring out of that master response. And I think that master sinful response is fear and distrust. It's fear. You know, if you look through the passage, you can do this later. I don't have the time right now to do it. But if you look through the passage, you'll see that there are several places where he hints at what he's afraid of. 
He just lists five. There's more, but here's five. He hints at what he's afraid of. of he's afraid of poverty and being displaced from where he lives. He says over and over again, the meek shall inherit the earth. So he's worried about, he's concerned about having a place. He's concerned about poverty, displacement. He's concerned about death. He doesn't want to be killed. He's concerned about God's abandoning him. And, you know, this is the one that was the most poignant for me. Look at verse 25. He's concerned about his children. He says, I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging bread. It's as though David's looking into the eyes of somebody and saying, don't worry, you righteous one. Don't turn to evil. Don't get all inflamed with rage. Don't worry. I know, what you, I know what's going to tempt you to become like that and to get all emotionally out of sorts. I know what's going to tempt you. You're going to look at your kids and you're going to say, no, don't let my kids be hurt. And now you're a mess because you're so afraid for them. See, these other responses, these other responses, fretting and distrusting and stopping delighting in God and resorting to anger, they come from fear. And the exact opposite is what he's telling us to do. He's telling us, oh, trust God. Trust Him. Believe. Believe. And delight in Him. Be at peace in your faith. Calm yourself in the light of who He is. And of course, this is just the universal key to all the trials we're ever in. <laughs> so, number one, we looked at the setting that He's in. The current distress. Number two, we looked at the temptations that result simply by uh, looking at the kind of directions he gives. And then number three, we need to look at reasons for quiet trust. Let's just look at the passage and let it speak to us, okay? I'm going to do very little interpreting here. I'm just going to start reading, reading verses for you. Because the psalm is filled with reasons why we should have quiet trust. Let's read them. Let me give you the three headings, though. First, you should, you should not fret and quietly trust God because of the sure fate of evildoers. The sure fate of evildoers. Verse 2, they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Verse 9, evildoers shall be cut off. Verse 10, in just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. Verse 13, the Lord laughs at the wicked. He sees his day is coming. Verse 15, there, that is their sword, the sword of the wicked, shall enter their own heart, and their bows shall be broken. And there's more in the psalm. But also, another reason to just quietly trust God is it's not just that, okay, Lord, I'm going to trust you to deal with the wicked, horrible, evil people because you promised that you're going to. So I'm going to, I'm going to just trust you for it. Also, another reason to just quietly trust in God is the ultimate fate of the godly. Look at verse 4. Verse 4 says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and verily you shall be fed is one way to translate that. And then it says in verse 4, Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. Verse 6, He will bring forth your righteousness as the light. And your justice as the noonday, that tells you that the psalmist is probably thinking he's going to be accused of evil doing himself. Which is the absolute worst thing that can happen when the wicked are out there, you know, promoting all their wickedness. And then it comes out that those people, one, one of the plots of the wicked is to make you seem wicked. And he says, 
don't worry. God's going to bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. In verse 11, the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. And verse 18, the Lord knows the days of the blameless and their heritage will remain forever. There's just a few. There's more in the psalm. And then, so number one, one reason for quiet trust is the sure fate of evildoers. And, and a second reason for quiet trust is the ultimate fate of the godly, but also the current, thirdly, the current fate of the godly. It's not that you have to, it's not that God is saying, just wait, you'll, you'll get blessings uh, in the next life. That's true, and that is a huge blessing. But God gives blessings now. Look what he says in verses 23 and 24. He says, the steps of a good man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. Though he fall, that is, though the good man fall, he shall not be cast headlong, for the Lord upholds his hand. See, the Lord now blesses the righteous. And sometimes when you're feeling miserable or afraid, you may feel like he's not blessing you, but if you just stop, step back and look at your life objectively, you'll see that along with the trials that have come through life has come immense blessing like almost never ceasing blessing. Every day, goodness is just being poured on you. Verse 25, I have been young and now I am old, and yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. See, God blesses people now. God rewards his children now. You don't have to wait till the next life, though in the next life it's going to be a thousand times better. All the good things you enjoy now are just foretastes. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, all of the good things you enjoy now are just little teeny foretastes of much greater glories and blessings to come. The Bible says that at God's right hand are pleasures forevermore in Psalm 16. But it's so important to recognize, too, that God blesses the righteous people in this life now, though along with uh, blessings come trials and hardships because it's a fallen world and God hasn't wrapped up his plan of redemption yet. But Psalm 27, 13 says, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Psalm 27, verse 13 there are plenty of reasons to rejoice if you get your eyes on him and you get them off your circumstances. I remember years ago when I was a little kid, I saw a very short movie preview of a movie that I've never seen. And I have no idea if it's any good. I almost don't even want to talk about it or give the name. But I'm going to go ahead and give the name anyways. Just know that I have no idea if it's any good or if it's filled with horrible things or not. But it's called My Bodyguard. And... Um, I, I never forgot the clip, the little probably 30-second clip that I saw. It just like branded itself on my mind. So watch what your kids see because a lot of times they'll remember it. Here I am, age 50, and I still remember it. But I remember there's this, you could pick up the, the gist of the story um, just by the short little clip. There's this little kid who's kind of a nerd, and he's, get, he's being bullied and there's this scene where the little kid is standing there facing the bigger kid, the bully. And the bully is, you know, intimidating him and, and making him feel like, you know, he might get his, his head knocked off his shoulders anytime soon. And then suddenly, right behind the kid is a much bigger kid. Right behind the little, the little kid who's being bullied is a much bigger kid, a kid much bigger than him and bigger than the bully. And the bigger kid puts his hands on his hips and basically, you know, just looks at the bully and says... Why don't you just pick on somebody your own size or maybe try me? And the, little, that, the bully just, you know, walks away scared to death because he doesn't want to get pummeled by the big kid. And there's this scene, once, once, once it moves away from that, if I remember correctly, and it's been a long time, I remember the emotions of this, though, very, very clearly. It goes from that scene to the bully hanging out with a little picked-on kid and becoming his friend. And there's this scene where the little boy is riding on a bicycle, and his hands are in the air, 
and it's, he's got a look of utter delight on his face as, as the hair, as, as the wind is blowing through his hair. And you can tell that he's just exulting in the fact that he doesn't have to be afraid anymore. He's free. Every day he had to go to school and face the fear and the shame. And now he's got his bodyguard. And the, and the, film, the name of the film is My Bodyguard. That scene, though, captures, I think profoundly captures what our emotional response is supposed to be when we realize that we have our God who promises that all things are supposed to work together for good to those who love God, even situations like this one that we're in. This is why it is so, and I keep hammering on this, and I feel like I'm hammering on it all the time, but... This is why it is so crucial that we have joy. That's why Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice, Philippians 4.4. It's so important because this is the proper response. I mean, what would it be like if that kid was still glum even after that bodyguard helped him? See, you have, dare I say it, you have an undefeatable bodyguard. He is constantly, in the Word of God, offering to you reasons to quiet yourself down and to be at peace and to have that strength that is peace and stillness. There is no reason to shame the Lord. There's no reason in God to shame the Lord by fear and fretting. During this, these times, no matter what they are, may the Lord cause his face to shine on every one of you and give you peace, not fear.